السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows what the hearts conceal and what the tongues will not reveal the one to whom all shall appeal and in front of whom the believers kneel Brothers and sisters history is something that the majority of us find boring and difficult to memorize and yet it is in knowledge of history that we have the best, the best weapons and tools to take on the Zionist narrative and the myth. So I was thinking for a long time, how can I summarize in these 25, 30 minutes the key features that I want all of us to know about the history of Palestine and of the creation of the illegitimate state of Israel. Because in the end of the day, this is a history that the majority of us are not aware of. And yet, when you read it, when you study it, any neutral observer cannot help but be astonished at the blatant arrogance at the trampling of human rights, at the insensitivities of the global superpowers. You don't have to be a Muslim to see the injustices of what has happened in Palestine. So I was thinking how best to summarize history for our audience. And what I decided to do, inshallah ta'ala, is to tackle it not from dry facts, not from giving you dates and whatnot, but rather from asking you to write down and to memorize five questions. So I encourage all of you to take out your phones or your pieces of paper and to write down five questions. These five questions shall be your arsenal or the beginnings of your arsenal when you engage in dialogue with those who don't know what's going on in Palestine, who don't know the reality of the situation in Israel. Now, you can begin your journey of knowledge by memorizing these five questions. And then I ask you to read and I ask you to listen to lectures and automatically information will come that will help you support each one of these five questions. The way that you learn history, by the way, is simply by reading and reading and reading and the facts then slowly get absorbed into our dense minds, right? You don't memorize for your high school history exam, then me remember it for the rest of your life. On the contrary, history is a slow process to absorb. So instead of bombarding you with dates and names, I want you to write down, as I said, five questions. Now, these five questions are skeletons. These are just the outer framework. As you read, and as you listen to lectures, you will get more information that will help you defend the five questions. But the five questions in and of themselves are your first line of defense. The first question, the first question, what gave the United Kingdom, Britain, England, what gave the United Kingdom the right to promise Palestine to a group of Europeans involved in the Zionist movement at the beginning of this century? That's your first question. What right did England have? What right did the United Kingdom have to promise this piece of land to fellow Europeans? Neither did England own this land, nor did the Europeans they promised it to have anything to do with it in recent history. This is your first question because this is where the history of the illegitimate state of Israel begins. Before this point in time, there is no actual history. And the biggest culprit to set everything in motion is the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom, England, Britain, is of course the last of the colonizing uh, forces. Our own country of America broke away from England 280 years ago because of, the, uh, because of the tyranny, because of how they felt about people of their own ethnicity, people of their own language. So England has a history of colonization and a history of trying to be an imperialist power. Palestine is the last project of colonialism. Palestine is the last settler colonization of pre-modernity and we are still suffering from the consequences. We are all aware Palestine had been ruled by the Muslims since the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab uninterrupted except for a brief interlude under the, under the Crusaders for around 90 years. And during that point in time, it was open for anybody to come, to live, to worship, to pray. 
There has not been a single case of civil war, of religious strife in the time of the Muslims. Muslims lived with Christians, with Jews together until the Crusaders came and shed blood for the first time. And then the Zionist enterprise was founded in the 1940s. So here is the first question. What gives Britain the right to promise Palestine to a group of Europeans in the Zionist movement in the turn of the century? Because because we're all aware that England made three contradictory and mutually exclusive promises. They blatantly lied to three separate entities about Palestine. Publicly, they promised the Arabs independence from the Ottomans if they rebelled against the Ottoman Caliphate. And they said to the Sharif of Mecca, the great, great, great grandfather of the current King of Jordan, they said to the Sharif of Mecca, they said to him, if you fight against your fellow Muslims and you fight against the Ottomans, we will make you the Khalifa and we will give you an Arab land from Iraq all the way to Tunisia. It will be yours. So they promised the Sharif of Mecca power. And they said, all we want you to do is fight against your fellow Muslims, the Ottoman Empire. Rebel against them and we'll make you the Khalifa. And of course, he didn't learn from previous mistakes and current rulers don't learn from past mistakes. The promises of these superpowers are not even worth the air that they're spoken with, much less the paper they are written on. And so, completely coincidentally, on the 5th of June, today is what day, guys? Today is what day? The 5th of June. We didn't plan this this way. On the 5th of June in 1916, that is 105 years ago. Today is the anniversary. Today, 105 years ago, the Sharif of Mecca attacked the Ottoman Empire. And do you know where he began the attack? Do you know which city he chose to begin the attack? Can anybody guess? Who knows? Close. Medina. Can you see the mentality? And I have to say this, even though this isn't the talk here. Yes, the ultimate blame lies on the outsider. The ultimate blame is on the superpowers and the imperialist forces. But the brutal fact of the matter is that those outside forces could not do what they did without internal traitors. And that is the ultimate reality. They could not do what they did if they didn't have people from within our own ranks pretending to be a part of us who cooperated with them against the interests of the ummah. And so this individual waged war against the Ottomans. He attacked Medina on the 5th of June, 1916, thus breaking away from the Ottoman Empire, hoping that he would be the next Khalifa. Because the promise was, if you break away, O Sharif of Mecca, you will be the next Khalifa and you will have Palestine, you will have Iraq, you will have Syria, you will have Egypt, all of it will be yours. And of course, this miskeen, this fool, did not know that behind his back, even as the British are promising him he will become the Khalifa, they already have a secret agreement with the French, with the Russian superpowers. And this is known as the Sykes-Picot Agreement. The Sykes-Picot Agreement was a hidden agreement. It was a secret agreement. Already decided that after World War I, just like the Muslim Ummah is a beautiful apple pie, each one is going to get a piece of the pie. And they already had a map. You can Google it. It's on Wikipedia, the actual map that Sykes and Pico, a Frenchman and a Britishman, argued over. And they drew these imaginary boundaries. Those imaginary boundaries are still in effect to this day. So as the British are telling the Arabs, rebel and you will be the Khalifa, they already have a secret agreement, the sykes pico agreement, and they've divided the Muslim lands amongst the superpowers. And technically, according to the sykes pico agreement, Palestine would be independent mandate. Nobody would have control over it. That was the secret agreement. Then they had an even more secret agreement. Three simultaneously. Three agreements simultaneously. And that secret agreement was even more secret than the Sykes-Pico. At least the Sykes-Pico was known to the three superpowers, their embassies, their presidents, their czars. They knew the Sykes-Pico agreement. 
As for the third promise and the third agreement, this was even more hidden and it only came to light many years later. And we have the original. These are no conspiracy theories. And this is, of course, the infamous Balfour Declaration. The infamous Balfour Declaration of 1917, in which the foreign minister of England promised Lord Balfour, who was the representative of the World Zionist Federation, that if it, basically if they helped them in World War I, that England would then hand Palestine over to the European Zionists, right? So this is something that was a secret promise, that if you help us, we're going to give you Palestine. And who are the Zionists? Long story here, but very briefly, Zionism is a European project began by secular Jewish people, not religious Jews. In 1897, Theodore Herzl and others, they were the first to begin speaking of a modern state in what is now Palestine. And when they began this project, religious Jews across the world rejected Zionism. This is well known. American Jews in particular had nothing to do with Zionism. They were not supportive of it at all. The Orthodox rabbis scoffed at Zionism. They thought it to be a type of heresy. They said, God will give us the kingdom when we're worthy of it. You cannot politically get the kingdom by killing and by causing massacres. This is what the Orthodox rabbis said. And there is still a small group of them, the Natura Kartai, that is still around to this day that have those original beliefs of those rabbis. Nonetheless, the project begun. And slowly but surely, because of the rising anti-Semitism, because of the rise of the Nazi party, because of a number of events, including the Dreyfus Affair, you can Google this, Zionism gained traction amongst secular-minded and then slowly even religious-minded uh, Jewish people. And so when World War I broke out, England felt it to be advantageous if they promised Palestine to the Zionist Federation. Now, what gives England the right to promise a land that is not theirs to a people that have nothing to do with it? This is the first question, and this is where it all begins. Remember, dear Muslims, remember this simple statistic. At the turn of the century, around 1900, there were barely 3% Jewish people in Palestine. This was the normal, this was the standard uh, uh, per, uh, uh, percentage for many millennia, 3%. And th these are Jewish Arabs. They speak Arabic. They're living amongst the Muslims. There has never been a single case of war, of civil war, of massacre, of murder, nothing. Jewish Arabs and Muslims and Christians are living side by side until the Zionist project begins. So in 1917, England promises Palestine to this Zionist entity and of course this promise is based on frankly a very racist superiorist nationalistic mindset the fact of the matter is that there must be an outright racism involved Europeans still to this day but especially back then did not view Arabs and Muslims as being equally human those brown and colored folks, they're not the same as us. And deep down inside, they had remnants of their Christianity, even though they claimed to be secular. And they had a dismissive attitude towards Islam. Not that they loved people of a Jewish background, but they hated Muslims more than they hated the Jews. That's really what it is. They hated Muslims and they dismissed Muslims more than they dismissed people of a Jewish background. Deep down inside, they saw Jewish people as still being an extension of their own, even if they didn't like them as fully equals, but at least the Judeo-Christian culture is a whole and the Islamic culture is outside. So they felt that by promising Israel, by promising Palestine to Zionists, they are fulfilling a Christian, a messianic promise that Jesus will only return when the Jews have gathered in the Holy Land. This is their belief. It is the belief of Baptists to this day. And deep down inside, there is an element of associating modern Judaism with the ancient ch children of Israel and modern Palestine with the ancient kingdom of David. This is really what it is. There is no actual secularism. Their deep-seated religious convictions are coming to light with these types of promises. So this is the first question. I hope you've written it down. The second question. 
What gave the United Nations the right to legislate the majority of the land of Palestine to Europeans of a Jewish background? This is the second question. What gave the United Nations the moral right? What gave them the moral right to then take the Balfour Declaration and make it a part of their constitution or their resolution? The United Nations was a newly formed body after World War II. And in the second year of their existence, 1947, it's a new organization, the United Nations. In one of its earliest resolutions, Resolution 181 if you want to write it down. In one of its earliest resolutions, Resolution 181, without consulting the local Arabs, without caring about what the Palestinian delegates said in their convention, the resolution divided the region of Palestine into three separate and distinct areas. 55% of that region was allocated to Jewish Zionists. 45% was given to the local Arabs and the city of Jerusalem was mandated to be independent, neither Jewish nor Arab. Before we even get to what happened afterwards, the second question is, what gives you the right, O United Nations, without consulting the local people, without doing polls and surveys, without asking those that live on the land that you're going to give their land to a group of foreigners. Now, by the way, we're now talking 1947. In this few decades, the Jewish population has risen from 3% to 30%. In one generation, it has multiplied tenfold, not because they're having children, but because Europeans are migrating and taking over the land. European money is financing the purchase, and also terrorist gangs are terrorizing Palestinian farmers, getting rid of them by hook or by crook. They're acquiring land. Still, by 1947, only 7% of the land was owned by people of the Zionist background. 93% is still in the hand of Arabs and Muslims. Only 7% is owned by those who have migrated from Zionist backgrounds. Yet, in 1947, what does the United Nations decide? The bulk of the land will go to those who just recently migrated literally in that generation. And a, small, a smaller amount will go to the local Arabs. The Arab delegates at the United Nations challenge this they said, this resolution goes against your own constitution, O United Nations. The United Nations in its constitution says that the right of self-determination shall not be taken away from any group of people. We have to get rid of colonization, the United Nations said. The United Nations was an idealistic vision. They thought that we're going to have global peace after World War II. They thought everybody's going to be treated equally and fairly. And within a year of its forming, within one year, they showed that in reality, power corrupts to the core. And those people who practice colonization directly are now going to do it indirectly. That's all the difference. Rather than invading directly, they're going to use proxies as they did with uh, the Zionist enterprise. And so, the United Nations ratified the ba Balfour Declaration. And they said that we are going to give 55% of the land. There is the original map. You can still find this online. Again, all of this is public information. The original map that the United Nations put in the resolution. And that map, we are very angry looking back at it. SubhanAllah, we, if we look at that map, one side will be, well, the world would be better if we actually followed that map. But you have to put yourself in the shoes of the Arabs and the Palestinians. Why should 55% of the land be given to foreigners? Why? Whose right is that? But even that was not good enough. Before we get to the third question. So the second question, what gives the United Nations the right to hand over the majority of that land to Europeans of the Zionist background? How did they get that privilege and right? This occurred in 1947. That's the second question. The third question, what gave the newly found state of Israel the moral right on the eve of its inauguration, as soon as it is born, to immediately launch a full-out offensive, to immediately force almost a million people to flee, to massacre 
thousands of people, we still don't know how many people were massacred, and to acquire almost 80% of the land from 55, now they, within their first inauguration, they are declared in August of 1948, right? August of 1948, the State of Israel declares its inauguration, and immediately, the next day, they launch an offensive against who? Against armies? Against the standing trained soldiers? No, against farmers and peasants, against people who have been farming there for generations and centuries, against people who don't have weapons, people who are still literally just their peasants, and the army of Israel, armed to the teeth, the precursors to the IDF, they now start attacking villages. Over 450 villages were attacked. Massacres occurred in dozens of places. Most infamously, Deir Yassin. Memorize this name. We have, not video footage, but photographic footage, grainy. Again, it's 1948. These are all histories that have been covered up and neglected, but now you cannot deny them. Throughout the 70s and 80s, the Israeli historians would deny, this isn't true, we found empty land, we found territories that we just walked into. There was never a massacre, and that's what the average person believed. No longer can that lie perpetuate and continue. We have documented evidence. The Israeli ministry has plenty of paperwork that they try to cover up. And even Israeli historians, those of you that are interested, the most significant historian in this regard is Elan Pape. I-L-A-N-P-A-P-P-E. -P -P -E. Write his name down. Purchase all of his books if you're interested. He is an Israeli born and raised historian at I believe Ben Gurion University, and he had to leave his position because of his research. He was getting death threats, his own fellow citizens, and he had to leave. He's currently living in England. But he is somebody who's researched the creation of Israel, and he has discussed and documented all of the cases of massacres. One of his most important works is to document every single massacre that he could find in the archives of the state of Israel. As far as we are aware, over 450 villages were wiped out. Their people had to flee for their lives. And there are plenty of video footage of the memories of elder people. In the 70s and 80s, they're interviewing old people about the memories of 1948, about the massacres that they saw, about their women and children being killed, about husbands. In Deir Yassin, over 100 people were gunned down, villagers, and then thrown into the well of the village. Now. What's going to happen if you're in the next village and you've heard that a hundred people have just been killed? What's going to happen? You're going to flee for your life. And that's exactly what happened. Almost a million Palestinians. Mass panic. Mass chaos. And this is called the first catastrophe, the Nakba. The first catastrophe, 1948. What gave this illegitimate state the right to engage in war crimes, to massacre, to terrify and terrorize almost a million people. And those people who fled, they are the ones now across the globe. Over seven million Palestinians are in the diaspora. I guarantee you in this audience of ours, we have people whose fathers and grandfathers were a part of the first Nakba, and we, already, we haven't even got to the second Nakba yet. So 1948, that is the third question, memorize it. What gave Israel the right? It was given 55%. We don't even agree with that, but they were not happy. And they're never happy. Zionist greed knows no bounds. No matter what you give them, they want more. They were given the majority of the land. Nope, they don't want that much, they want more. The day they're born, the day they're born, they go to war and they conquer more than 80%. And make no mistake about this, this was a planned and calculated offensive. They knew that they wanted more land. They were not happy at the UN resolution giving them 55% of the land. They wanted more and they got it. Just like that video footage of a fellow American from Brooklyn, right? Our own fellow American, no ties to that land, speaks in a New York accent. He lands in that state. He's given nationality and he walks in to a Palestinian's house. Our Palestinian brothers say, how could you do this? Why are you stealing our land? And he speaks directly and innocently in his own way, but he betrays the reality of the Zionist mindset. 
And he says, it's not a big deal. If I don't steal it, somebody else will. That is the Zionist mindset. It's going to be stolen. I might as well take it myself. It's the same mindset from 1948 that we are seeing up until now. If I don't steal it, somebody else will. So in 1948, they attacked the surrounding lands and they conquered over 80% of the lands. Almost two-thirds of what was assigned to our Palestinian brothers and sisters was taken in 1948. Can you imagine going to court because somebody has stolen a hundred dollars of yours and you know he's stolen it the court knows he's stolen it the court says okay fine we'll give you 45 dollars back you're angry you protest as you walk back home the thief drops you again and from that 45 he takes another 25 and you end ended with 20 dollars that is the reality of what happened to palestine within a year from 100 dollars they move down to 20 and not just that with that 20 they don't have the house they're living in they have to feed five times the amount of people People, the whole situation has changed. This is the reality of the 1948 Nakba, and that's our third question. The fourth question, even that did not satisfy the greed of Zionists. So the fourth question, what gave this Zionist apartheid regime the right to launch yet another attack, yet another war, the 1967 war known as the Six Day War, in which their greed knew no bounds and they conquered the Gaza Strip and they took over the entire West Bank and they invaded Jerusalem and they marched on the Aqsa complex with their weapons, with their boots, with their machine guns. They killed people in the masjid and they took over physically. A lot of Muslims don't know this. In 1967, up until 67, Masjid al-Aqsa was not under the control of the Zionist entity. It was independent as the United Nations had initially asked for. In 1967, in the Six-Day War, the apartheid regime invaded simultaneously. This was again a meticulous plan. Their air force and their military and their IDF simultaneously attacking multiple fronts and they conquered the Sinai Peninsula they took over what is now the Gaza Strip and they took the entire West Bank now a lot of us who've never been there we don't know what the West Bank is the West Bank is an entire region that has many key cities Ramallah, Nablus, Jericho, Bethlehem, Hebron, Beit Khalil these are historic cities these are Palestinian cities and in 1967 still there was some independence of that entire region but Zionism knows no bounds when it comes to greed. And they invaded and they took over and acquired and now they control who comes in and out. And they control the demographics and they control the citizenship of those regions along with Gaza and along with East Jerusalem, the Muslim quarters of Jerusalem. They took over that. Just grab, just invade, just take. And by the way, what is the United Nations doing in 1948, in 1967? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Mere condemnations. A generic resolution. Nothing is done. No boycott, no sanctions, nothing. And that is why history is so important for us to learn. Because anybody who has an open mind will see the plight of the Palestinians. Anybody who understands what is justice will side with that of the Palestinians. You cannot side with Zionism if you know even the basic understanding of history of that region. So in 1967, another Nakba, the second Nakba, the Palestinians called two Nakbas, 1948 and 1967. And in 1967, another large group of Palestinians, perhaps around another 600,000, were expelled in the second Nakba. And from these two Nakbas, 1948 and 1967, as we said, Palestinians spread around the globe. We currently have roughly 7 million Palestinians around the globe in the diaspora. Roughly 7 million people who cannot go back to the land of their ancestors because they were forcibly expelled in either the first Nakba or the second Nakba. A quick show of hands. How many of you Palestinians in the audience trace your roots to the first Nakba, 1948? 1948. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 1967, how many? How many of you? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 25. 
In this audience of ours, we have around 15 whose ancestors go back to the first Nakba and 25 whose ancestors go back to the second Nakba. And why are there Palestinians across the globe? There's large groups of Palestinians in South America, in Mexico, in Denmark, across the globe. Why? Because they don't have a land of their own. They were forcibly expelled. They don't have a place they can call home. They were forced to flee. And of course, the largest group of, of, of refugees, by the way, the United Nations said, Palest has said, the United Nations has said that Palestinians are the largest group of refugees of any nationality or ethnicity in the world. There is no competition in terms of numbers. The number one group of refugees is Palestinians. Why? Because of the greed of Zionism, the first Nakba and the second Nakba. So that is the fourth question. What gave the state of Israel the, uh, the further right to launch another attack and to gobble up all of these lands? The Sinai Peninsula was taken eventually because of a negotiation with Carter, Jimmy Carter, they handed it back to Egypt. The Sinai Peninsula was taken. The West Bank was taken and the Gaza Strip was taken along with Jerusalem and of course Jerusalem was made the capital under Trump as you're aware. All of this goes back to 1967. And by the way, again, complete coincidence, that war began on the 5th of June. 1967. It just so happens our conference is taking place the 5th of June. So 54 years ago was the second Nakba. Literally to the day. Today, surprise attack and what happened, happened. The fifth and final question. The fifth and final question. And this is not necessarily a past history. It is current situation. By what moral right does the government of Israel treat those same Palestinians that it has kicked out and placed in the situation that they're in with the type of subhuman restrictions that it does. What gives the Israeli government the right to treat Palestinians in a manner that no government on earth treats any other group of people? What right do they have to do that? And here is where we need to arm ourselves with the knowledge of reality on the ground. What is life like for the people in Gaza? And again, for most of us who have not been, and by the way, this is one of the most important reasons why we need to go. A lot of people say, what can we do? A lot that we can do. But definitely one of the things that I'm a huge advocate of, you just heard Dr. Mustafa Abu Sway also say this, that those Muslims who are able to travel to Palestine, to Masjid Al-Aqsa, they should go there, but with one condition. And that condition is non-negotiable. And that condition, they must support the Palestinian economic infrastructure. They must go to Palestinian hotels. They must hire Palestinian buses. They must hire Palestinian guys. They must go to Palestinian tourist agencies. That is the only condition that I'm an advocate of, that we visit Palestine to support our Palestinian brothers and sisters in their businesses and then to see the reality firsthand. I have been there five times. Every single time I take a group of people from this country, one of the largest groups, Alhamdulillah, from America, 100, 150 people typically go with me. And every single batch, they're just shocked. How can this be happening? How can the world not know? When you see it, it's different. When you see that barbed wire, when you see that 30-foot wall, that cement wall, when you see the reality of life within the settlements and outside the settlements, when you're within an Israeli settlement, it's as if you are living in, in California. It's as if you are in Dallas, Texas, the greenery, the, the, the water, the electricity. As soon as you step outside, literally, there's a wall. As soon as you step outside, the trash, the junk, people are living on the streets and you see the disparity and you see how people are treated you have to see it to believe it and this is a reality that is not shown on Western TV when you go there you take video footage you can be ambassadors see for yourself the reality of Gaza Gaza has been called by multiple people multiple personalities the largest open-air prison in the world over 2 million people. The highest concentration of human beings on earth is in Gaza. Over 2 million people are trapped. They cannot exit or come in without Israeli permission. The joblessness is in the 60%. The situation in terms of health care, the situation in terms of medicine, in terms of education. What is going to happen when you have 2 million people locked up for over 70 years? What's going to happen? And this is not a justification of violence at all. But nonetheless, and I say this, I used to teach a, at a college, I would say this, our founding fathers revolted and went against their kings in England because 
of a tax on tea. They couldn't sip their tea anymore. And so they revolted against the king and they did what they did. What is going to happen when people don't have water to drink? When their children die because there's no medicine? When joblessness is 70%? When there is no future in sight? Why is it okay for our founding fathers to do what they did? But anyway, that is besides the point. This is food for thought as well. The point being, our fifth question is, by what moral right does the government of Israel treat Palestinians in a subhuman manner? No government on earth treats other people the way that Israel treats its Palestinians. And by the way, people from South Africa who have lived under apartheid have called Israel an apartheid state. People that are not Muslims, that don't have their loyalties to the Ummah, they have called Israel an apartheid state. Memorize these names. First and foremost, the number one on the list for us in America is Jimmy Carter, our own president. He's written a book. The title of the book is, what is the title of the book, guys? Peace, not apartheid. That's the title of the book. Peace, not apartheid. Jimmy Carter is an evangelical. He's not a Muslim. He's not somebody whose loyalties are to the religion. But he has observed and he has said, this is apartheid. Desmond Tutu, the senior most bishop of the Catholic faith in Africa, visited the occupied territories. And he was so emotionally overcome. He was so moved. And he said that what he has witnessed has reminded him of South African apartheid. Standing long in lines, people with submachine guns checking you out, complete privileges taken away. This is Desmond Tutu. And then Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela. Is anybody going to accuse Nelson Mandela of being unbiased and unfair? De Nelson Mandela has called Palestine under apartheid occupation. And he is somebody who knows what apartheid is. So anybody who sugarcoats this reality, you call them out. Say, I'm not calling it an apartheid state. Our own president did. And people who have lived under apartheid know exactly what it is, have pointed this out. As we come to the conclusion, these are the five questions that I want everybody to write down and memorize. And as we read and as you study history, inshallah, you yourself will start chalking up more details that you can, you can use to, to defend these five questions. But you know what, brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, the tide is changing. And we see this, all of us that remember what it was like in the 80s and 90s, we now see the very beginnings of the glimmer of the potential light at the end of the tunnel. For the very first time, Alhamdulillah, thumma Alhamdulillah, people, politicians, mainstream media, I wouldn't say speaking up, that's still too much, but at least presenting the other side. For the very first time, mainstream institutes, politicians, congressmen and congresswomen, for the very first time, are now brave enough and able to point out the realities of life for our Palestinian brothers and sisters. Allah Azza wa Jal knows when the victory is going to come. But one thing is for sure, the fact that is undeniable is that the Zionism project has been a massive failure from its very inception. It has been a massive failure from its inception and from its actualization and from its current existence. Zionism, the example that I have is like somebody trying to dig a hole to get to the other side of the world. And before it's too late, he keeps on digging, digging, digging. He thinks he's going to get there and he has deluded himself and he's deluded some people to think he's going to get to the other side. But in reality, it's only a matter of time before the allies and supporters all see through the vicious lies. And eventually, as he's digging and digging and digging, he shall collapse in the web of his own lies and under the avalanche of his own inhumanity and barbaric practices. It is impossible for such blatant injustice to flourish. It is impossible for such blatant injustice to flourish. It is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that truth shall prevail over falsehood and that eventually those who suffered injustices, they will be answered to and their 
du'as will be responded to. So we make du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to lift the problems and suffering of our Palestinian brothers and sisters. We make du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to return Masjid al-Aqsa to its rightful owners. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we see the day that Masjid al-Aqsa is a bastion of freedom and a symbol of the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. We pray that all of us can pray in Masjid al-Aqsa when it is free and when it is safe and when it is secure. And we ask Allah azza wa jal to make us all instruments that will bring about that realization. Wa jazakumullahu khayran. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.